Hi friends. One thing I've always been a big believer of is that there's room for everyone. We've talked a lot about this on this show, but I hope you've noticed that we also try to make you aware of other podcasts that we think you might like because we recognize different things appeal to different people and different perspectives are powerful. So I wanted to make sure you've heard about LDS Living's newest podcast, Magnify, which is geared toward women and seeks to explore how women of God can use their influence to make a difference in the world. I got a sneak peek of this week's episode where the host, Catherine Davis, interviews her sister, someone we all likely recognize and someone I personally admire, Sister Michelle Craig of the Young Women General Presidency. The episode was wonderful, so I just wanted to encourage you to check it out. Now we'll get to this week's episode. Last year, Heidi Swap wrote... 2015 feels like a million years ago. I guess it's because that's when my whole world changed completely in a way that I would have never imagined. On July 9th, my 16-year-old son, my second oldest of five children, made the decision to end his own life by suicide. Complete shock does not even begin to describe how I felt. Whether it be ignorance or optimism, I just didn't even know anything about suicide. Sure, I had known a few stories of people that had ended their lives, all of which I carried a certain critical judgment that was completely based on zero facts, 100% lack of understanding or compassion. So when suicide became a reality in my own family with my own beautiful, funny, charismatic, charming, athletic, life of the party, best smile award winning high school sophomore, newly driver's license son, I was completely devastated and everything I believed about my family, my parenting and life as I knew it was shattered. Today, we talk with Heidi Swap about how seeking to help others understand the things she wished she'd known helped her pick up the pieces in the years since, and how all of us can begin what she calls everyday suicide prevention with the people we love. Heidi Swap is perhaps best known within the scrapbooking community as she calls herself a memory keeper. She is the creative director of her own Heidi Swap brand. For years following her son Corey's passing, Heidi was the co-host of a podcast called Light the Fight, which sought to bring light to tough topics related to personal and family relationships. As September is Suicide Prevention Month, we are so grateful to Heidi for her willingness to share her story. This is All In, an LDS Living podcast where we ask the question, what does it really mean to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm Morgan Pearson, and I am honored to have Heidi Swap on the show with me today. Heidi, welcome. Thanks for having me, Morgan. Well, this is kind of an interesting thing. I I feel like, Heidi, to be able to circle back around seven years ago, you and I spoke shortly after you lost your 16-year-old son, Corey, to suicide. And I don't know how much you remember about that interview, but I found myself thinking about it the last little bit as I've prepared to interview you again and have thought about how I feel like my life is a lot different and circumstances in my family are a lot different than they were then. I feel like I have learned a lot about interviewing people. And and so I appreciate your patience with me then because I'm sure I was just like a mess. But I (laughs) also just remember how gracious you were to talk, especially so soon after Corey's passing, that you were so gracious in wanting to share the things that you were learning with other people and to hopefully spare other people the same pain that you were experiencing, which I think is one of the most Christ-like things anybody could do. So thank you for that. (laughs) Um, But second, I, I wondered how you would say that you are a different person than you were seven years ago when we last spoke. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. You know, it's funny when you reached out and you reminded me that you were the one who interviewed me because we never met. We only interviewed over the phone. And, you know, that was the first interview that I ever gave. It was the first time that I'd, and I don't even know why I agreed to do that (laughs) at that time. And I think to, to your point, I was really trying to find a voice. I was certainly recognizing that, that I wasn't alone 
with suicide affecting my family. And I was realizing that I had an opportunity to, to share that story. And I think that my personal passion, which has also kind of bubbled into my, my profession is that I believe in the power of stories and the importance of stories. And so I knew really soon thereafter Corey passed away that it would be important for me to share the story. And that's not to say that was my first thought <laughs> because I think that my, my first thought was, was honestly like, what was a, what was a lie that I could come up with that would maybe be easier to, to talk about than, than the truth of what happened. And so, you know, I was thinking back to when we did that interview and, you know, for, for people who don't know me, just a little teeny bit of background that's a little bit interesting is that <laughs> if, if you'll, if you'll pardon this really broad and, and interesting description I'll give of myself, but, but people would call me a scrapbook celebrity, which is weird. Very, I know does it just cringe for a second is fine. But for the last 20 years, I have been published in magazines back in the magazine world. I've had books published. I've had a, a blog. And when you're a scrapbooker, you share these really intimate photos and stories. And so from the time, I mean, I started teaching scrapbooking classes when I was pregnant with my son, Corey, who passed away. And so because in that, that span of his lifetime, I had, you know, shared hundreds of photos and stories about him and the people that were following me, whether they had followed me. I mean, there was, there was a lot of years there that, that, in his life, 16 years that people had followed me and, and grown to know Corey in that way. And so when he passed away and I realized it would be necessary for me to tell what happened and it was still really hard for me to talk about it, you know, when, when we first chatted and at the same time, it was really important for me to share the story because I knew that via social media and via Facebook, this article would be a way that I could both share the story and also share my faith, which has always been an important opportunity for me to give, give a, a little insight into my belief system. And that always goes along in scrapbooking, no matter where I've been teaching the family and the faith parallelism in my life has always gone hand in hand. So I've always talked about my faith and specifically the article that you were, you were interviewing me for was in the faith section, but also interestingly at that time, Harriman, where I live in Utah was also kind of a little hotbed for, for teenage suicide. And thereabouts it had gained some national attention for that very reason and 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 so i felt like i wanted to be able to share that story and honor Corey and what we were then dealing with so you know you asked me how things are different in 7 years and 7 years is an, is a good long time. I can remember meeting people there in the beginning when, when we asked in the beginning that would say to me, Oh, this is very fresh for you. And, and now seven years later, I understand what that means, you know, for sure. Like, for example, when we first spoke, I, it's a wonder that you could even understand me. I'm sure that I was crying throughout the interview it was very difficult for me to talk without crying and you know I, it still is <laughs> i'll be honest at that time i didn't have a lot of vocabulary about how i felt about suicide about in general what 
I was learning or what I was even facing. And so I, I can remember still just really having a hard time finding words. I can remember being in interviews and there'd be just a, a lot of stuttering and, and me just really kind of grappling to try to, to really express myself. Since that time, about two and a half or so years after Corey passed away, I started a podcast with Corey's therapist. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because obviously I knew that his therapist was only able to meet with one person at a time in the confines of, of a, a little room. And I, and at that time I'd already been kind of in some coaching with him, not so much therapy, but more of a coaching relationship that he and I had. And I was learning so much so quickly and I just wanted every mom out there to somehow have an opportunity to learn what I was learning. I, every, every time I met with his name's David Kozlowski and every time I met with him and every time, in fact, we would have these podcast sessions I just would think to myself, I wish I knew this 20 years ago. I wish this was information that I had access to when I was a young mom with young kids, because the way that I naturally interacted with my kids and directed them and managed our relationships was very much just a spillover from how I had been raised. And and never had I been, I never thought about the the way that I was talking or my body language or any of the, the things that I was then learning that certainly impacted the relationship. And so seven years ago, so, so we have done the podcast for about four and a half years. I've kind of stepped away from it. It's kind of going in a different direction now. David is heading it up on his own. And... I do have a lot of vocabulary. I do have a lot of opinions. Since that time, I have, I've been invited to speak at lots and lots of different types of events, whether they were within the church or outside the church, whether they were to professionals or teachers, to students, to elementary age students, all the way up through college age students, to missionaries, to what is my favorite audience, which is mothers, I have really tried to gather and hone in and focus in on the things that I wish I would have known the most and the skills and the shift in perspective, the shift in approach that I wish that I would have known about. And I'm if you talk to my older kids, so interestingly enough, we have five kids. My husband and I have five kids. The oldest three were really close in age. And then there was this five-year gap and we had two more kids that were actually even closer in age, only 11 months apart. And if you ask my older kids, the older set, you know, like how I am as a, as a mother now, they just think my, my babies, my littles, as we call them, they're 15 and 16. So they're not even that little anymore, but I'm a very different parent. My approach is very different. The relationships are very different. The way that I approach problems are very different. The things that are important to me are very different. And so, I mean, if, if you, the original question that you asked me, you know, really is like, what is different? And I would venture to say that literally everything is different. Heidi, that was so well said. And I want to tell you, you're not giving yourself enough credit for that first interview that we did. But it is interesting to think about because I think now, I think I got assigned that story, if I remember correctly. Somebody that followed you said, you know, you should reach out to this lady. And I now, knowing what I know in the last seven years, I never would have reached out to somebody that it was that fresh. Just because a lot of times I've found you have people 
that are actually the opposite of your situation where I was the one approaching you, but you have people that reach out because they've just gone through something and they feel a desire, I think, to give purpose to that experience. And so (laughs) they want to talk about it. But I have found that it seems like it's best to let people process a little bit. So I am so excited to learn from you today because you were wonderful then. You were wonderful (laughs) seven years ago. But I think that you you have put in the work now and it's so clear in the way that you talk. You you were you were wonderful, like I said, wonderful then, but you're you have this confidence. Like you said, you have the vocabulary now, and that's so clear in talking to you. And so I'm so excited to kind of dig into some of these principles that you teach and that you've pulled out from the things that you've learned. You talk a lot, Heidi, about how it's important to have what you call everyday suicide prevention, meaning that it's something that people should be actively doing, whether they think there's a problem or not, just by the way that we interact with people that we care about. So you have eight different principles that you talk about as it relates to suicide prevention. And I wondered if we could just kind of hit these and just have you share the things that you've learned. And certainly I should tell people if they want to go listen to the episodes of the podcast that you've been involved with, like you said, you're not as involved now, but light the fight is where you can learn way more from Heidi. But today we'll just kind of hit this high level stuff. The first principle that you talk about is don't freak out. Tell me what you mean by that. So that's probably my my number one message to to parents to anybody and it and it really is because I am like the the OG freaker outer. You, you know, like freaking <laughs> out <laughs> just comes so naturally. In fact, in in the beginning we started doing like parent events that we would go to schools and the name of the events were don't freak out. And originally in the very, very beginning, this was one of the first things that David talked to me about because everything I, I'm a, I'm a very emotionally charged. I'm a very passionate person. I'm kind of a a big personality. And I also just like things done a certain way. I have very high expectations of myself and others. <laughs> and so when when things don't go as planned, freaking out comes very naturally. And so initially, the, the one of the very first things that he talked to me about, actually even before Corey passed away, was that I had to get control of my response. And one of the things that he would... David, I'm talking about David Kozlowski, is he would say to me, you know, when a first responder comes to the scene of an accident, it's critically important that that first responder is calm, is totally calm, and doesn't ask a million questions. And so, you know, I would always share with parents, you know, what if a first responder came up and let's say that you've been in an accident, let's say that maybe you've caused the accident. And this first responder is like, Oh, I bet you were texting, weren't you? How fast were you going? Do what were you thinking? Why, why in the world would you be driving this fast? What were you doing? You know, and, and we kind of spew out these questions. And if you can imagine being on the other end of somebody that has some power and authority coming to you and just like asking you a million questions, harsh, shaming, triggering, alarming questions that immediately your response to that person would just be to completely shut down. You would be scared. You would feel insecure and safe. You would feel like, you know, that wasn't somebody that you wanted to open up to or even let them help you at all. And so normally when a first responder comes to the scene of an accident, the the first thing they're going to do is make sure you're okay. They're going to try to get you to calm down. They're going to make sure you're safe. They're going to remove you from the scene of that accident. And then once you've had a chance to take a breath, they're going to say, you know, can you tell me what happened? You know, to walk me through what happened. And in your own words, without feeling condemned and without feeling scared, you would have a chance to to share that and a space to share that, you know, from a really young age, I think that we, as parents, even when our kids are super young, 
we train them that when they do something wrong, we freak out. We let them know, like you, you spill milk and it, sh- and it sp- splatters all over the entire kitchen and we lose our cool. And you're walking out to church and you can't find one of the shoes and you lose your cool and you leave your bike for the 50th time behind the car and it gets run over. We lose our cool. And my favorite one is like, and Morgan, I don't think you have kids, but there, there may come a time when you have like kids strapped in car seats and you go through a drive through and they're like, you know, I want a smoothie. And you're thinking to yourself, I'm such a good mom for just driving through this and just giving them a smoothie because they love it and they want it. And so you just, you hand that smoothie back to the car seat and, you know, before you can even pull out that smoothie is down inside (laughs) the car seat. And immediately you're like, okay, so that's going to rot. It's going to stink. We're on our way to, you know, someplace that we don't have time for this and, and you freak out. When you show your kids over and over and over from the time they're super young to the time that they're 13, 14, 15, they're done telling you the messes that they've made. They will tiptoe around you. They will do everything possible to mitigate any freakouts. Kids hate it when their parents freak out. Parents hate having to freak out. It's, it goes both ways. But I think that this number one first thing, anybody listening to me in any circumstance, no matter what the relationship is, this is something that you can work on immediately right now, everyday suicide prevention, is when something goes wrong, slow down. It's okay to use humor. It's okay to take a step back. It's okay to talk to yourself and say, all right, well, not going to freak out (laughs) and give yourself a little pep talk, but perhaps the most powerful thing that you can do to build a relationship of trust with the people who you love the most is to, to not freak out. Amazing. That makes complete sense. And I, I will, when I have kids, I, you will be the voice resounding in my head when the smoothie gets dumped in the car seat. It will um, <laughs> the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, you wrote on Instagram, I'm one of those people who sometimes can't help worrying about might or could happen. And by that, I mean, what could go wrong? I am also one of those people, Heidi. Uh, you said, and, and so I wondered why is living in the present or as you put it, just take one day at a time so important? You know, I think that the reality is it every day, especially when, and, I, and I'm going to just take a, a minute and, and speak to just being a parent of teenagers. You know, a lot of things can go wrong every single day with a parent of teenagers, certainly depending on what your expectations are in terms of like what's going on with their grades, what's going on with their friends, what's going on, you know, maybe they're driving, maybe they're in an athletic situation or, you know, whatever that situation is, one of the things that we can do that, that actually causes us to freak out and it actually causes us to not be very trustworthy with our kids is that we, we get into something that, that David Kozlowski would call a time machine. Um, and let me explain it to you. It would, it would go something like this. Well, if you can't do your math homework and you fail your test and you fail this class, how are you going to graduate from high school? How are you going to get into college? How are you going to get a job? How are you going to support a family? if you can't even do this math assignment, right? And this is something that vividly, I remember my parents saying to me, and it it could be anything. It could be like, if you can't even make your bed right now, how are you going to take care of a home and a family? Or if you can't even come home at midnight, when you say you're going to come home, how am I ever going to trust you to do this or this or this? Or what happens is the behaviors that are existing or the fears that we have about the behaviors existing, we immediately want to mentally prepare ourselves for everything that could go wrong 
And we do a disservice to ourselves and to our kids by condemning them to some future fate based on something that's happening right now. But I mean, yes, you can see where those dots could, could connect. But the reality is stay in today. Do that for yourself. Do that for your kids. Because if we start putting these mounds of pressure about what kind of a mom they're going to be, about what kind of a provider they're going to be for a family, about what their high school or what their college experience is going to be like when they're a sophomore in college or in high school, (laughs) all we're doing is just mounting pressure that does not even need to be there. So, you know, I, I think every mom, you put a brand new baby in their arms and immediately you start worrying about if they're going to be made fun of, if they're going to make friends, if they're going to be able to learn to read, if, are they going to be, you know, whatever's going to happen. And, and those, the worrying, which is very natural. I mean, we really are, are programmed to worry. It's, It's not a bad thing. What happens is when we start really condemning ourselves or others from the time machine that just doesn't, doesn't even exist. There's, you know, I, I would much rather believe that every day is a fresh start and that the possibilities are endless and that we're meant to make mistakes so that we can do better, be better, and um, and be more equipped when the time comes. No 15-year-old is equipped to face what they're going to be equipped to, to face when they're 25. And we're the same way. And so I think that the thing that David would say to me all the time is that I just needed to stay out of the time machine and just be in that moment, dealing with the things that were happening in the moment. That's so good. And it, it makes so much sense. I think that that is such a, such a great example and such a good concept to keep in mind. Another thing you said, you quoted Maya Angelou, who said something that has made a big impact on you. She said, forgive yourself for not knowing what you didn't know before you learned it. How did your experience in the days following Corey's passing teach you this? And how is this applicable in other situations as well? Because I think that thought is so profound. Well, and I mean, even when I, when we were kind of just introducing the podcast today, I kind of talked about this. I, I genuinely thought every single day, I wish I would have known this 20 years ago. I wish I would have changed this. I wish I would have thought about this. And I would think to myself, maybe Corey would be alive, you know, if I would have done this different or if I would have behaved differently, if I would have talked differently. And, and that, and that may or may not be true. I don't, I don't know. There's no way for me to know that. And so I would in, I would literally have to read this quote to myself or say it in my head every single day to myself, because first of all, there was no way that I could have even opened myself to understanding what, what I needed to change or what I needed to learn without that experience. Because I, I, because I never would have like been as passionate about, about learning or, or asking myself those questions because I just, because I just wouldn't, I just wasn't in that circumstance to even consider those things. And so at that time, me continuously beating myself up was not serving me in my marriage. It wasn't serving me in parenting the other four kids that were alive. It wasn't serving me in my business. It wasn't serving me any where and so this concept of forgiving myself and forgiving myself and forgiving myself and giving myself that grace was literally the only way I could move forward. I think 
you know, like I said, I think that that is so applicable to so many different situations. We always, you know, think what could have been differently had I known this. Yeah. And so keeping that in mind, I think is critical, no matter what the situation in life. Another thing you've talked about is how you believe it's important to talk with kids and to also recognize ourselves that everything we think may not be reality, or as you put it, don't believe everything you think. What have you learned about how you just mentioned, you know, uh, talking about thoughts, not serving you, but what have you learned about how we should approach thoughts? (laughs) <laughs> well, I can remember the very first time that that David and I keep referring to David, so I'm I'm sorry, but he he's been my teacher and my mentor. No, I think it's awesome. <laughs> I remember the first time and what we were we were talking about, and this is real soon after Corey died, and I I kind of felt like maybe all of my children should be taken away from me because I was such a bad mom. It, that was kind of the message in my head. And at the time we were really working with understanding the difference between shame and guilt, which I think is something, you know, is very readily discussed now, seven years later, but even seven years ago, that wasn't something like Brene Brand hadn't like broken the, <laughs> the silence, um, of really understanding that. And so it was like this mind blowing experience for me because the shame that I had was this continuous thought of what a horrible mother I was and that good moms don't have their kids die from suicide, you know? And so this was a a core belief that I was entertaining every day was what a bad mom I was. And I remember when David said to me, don't believe everything you think. And I was like, well, I'm right. (laughs) I'm always right. (laughs) And so I think that was the first time that I started to realize that I didn't, I didn't know everything. (laughs) And just because I thought it and just because it made sense to me and just because it was what I was taught maybe my whole life, I didn't necessarily need to believe it. I needed to, to question it. And think about it, think about it from different perspectives. A lot of times we get into really dangerous thought patterns. And now of course it, it makes sense because we have all kinds of shameful thoughts that come into our heads, whether they come from ourselves, whether they come from our experiences or, or wherever they may come from. I think that teaching our kids that every thought that passes through their head isn't real reality. You know, the other, the other um, phrase that he uses is to, to illustrate this, to teach it is he says, you know, this is, these are real, your real feelings, what you're feeling is real, but it also may not be reality. And we have to have people in our lives that we can trust enough to help us distinguish whether or not what we're thinking is, is reality or not. And maybe that's a really good friend when you, you know, you're saying, does does my butt look fat in these jeans or do I actually look okay? And do I believe you? Because we can't always even believe what we see in the mirror, you know? And so this is part also of really having relationships with your children that are trusted They know that you're in control. They know that you're not irrational all the time as well. And that you can start distinguishing the difference between rational thoughts and really irrational thoughts. Heidi, I think the thing that's so cool about listening to you talk about these things is that it's... I don't know. I just am so touched by the fact because I'm thinking about it. Like if you're a parent and you're listening to somebody tell you like, this is what you're supposed to do. And I can imagine if I was a mom and had already raised some kids and felt like I wasn't doing everything right, then I'm like, oh man, like I have, I have not done a good job, but I love the way that you approach this topic and the way that it feels like 
it's never too late right? To start being the kind of person that you want to be and to learn the things that are going to make a difference. And um, I don't know. I just, I have this feeling, Heidi, that Corey has to be so proud of you. And I'm grateful that you're willing to share all that you're learning or have learned. You said one of the most important things that you've learned in the past seven years has been what you call the and, which essentially means two things can be true at the same time. Is that right? Am I getting that right? Yes. This was a big one for me because I think that, and, and I'll even say, I think being raised in the church, I was raised by very stalwart parents. And so everything was very much a black and white experience for me. It was wrong or it was right. It was good or it was bad. And there was just really no gray area or room for something to be good and better and best. And, you know, some of those things were hard for me. And so it was very much this, like, I didn't experience, like if, if I was, for example, if work was bad, if work was going bad for me, then it was like all condemned to hell. Like I hated everything and I, I was super upset and I didn't ever realize that I could be like, I'm really mad about this thing at work. And I'm also just really grateful for my work. And so I'm, I'm going to work through this. Right. Right. I think sometimes what happens, like if a kid comes home from school and someone has been mean to them, literally it means that everything about school is horrible. Everything about them is horrible. Everything about their day is horrible. Everything about learning is horrible. And and that might be true for like, here's another example. Like if, if you have a kid that fails a math test and let's say that that kid probably isn't that great at math. They come home and they've failed at math and now they're just stupid. They're stupid, bad at everything. They're, they have, and they just have no hope and they may as well just give up. And and now everything is awful and ruined. And I think that it's really important to be able to say, yeah, you're right. You, you are not thriving in math right now. And you're really doing great in history. And look at you, you just ran the mile in eight minutes. This is incredible. Like, or, and, you know, you're, you didn't really study, remember? And, you know, so I think that when kids are upset, it tends to feel like the whole, everything is just awful. And I mean, and you can, anybody who's listening can probably think of a time where one thing in your life, one aspect in your life has gone wrong. And that just casts a shadow over every single thing. And you can't even see the good because it just like sits right on top of your eyeballs. So I think that it's very healthy to be able to distinguish like that one thing that in your life that isn't going well, isn't every single thing in your life and that we can feel different things at the same exact time. We can, we can feel happy and sad at the same exact time. And I just didn't even know that that was possible. And, and it kind of even extended, like I told you, there was a long time there that I was really struggling with just feeling like I was a horrible parent. And David would say, you know, you can feel like you're a a terrible parent and you also might not be a terrible parent. And that kind of helped me give space to feeling different things and considering different things and, and being multiple things at the same time. And I think that it helps you be a little less irrational and a little less freaking out and having a little less extreme frustration. For sure. Another principle that you teach that I love is the idea that now is not forever. As I read that, I thought it was interesting because sometimes I think it's like we want our nows to last forever. Like sometimes it's like, I want to sit in this moment forever. And other times we want to know that that now will not last forever. So how has that brought you comfort and how can it help those that are struggling? 
you know, I, I have to be careful every time I talk about this because there are certain circumstances that, that may be a lifelong circumstance right. that you're dealing with. But for the most part, everything changes. Every circumstance changes. And you'll hear people say, I always this, or I'm always left out. I always struggle at this. I always this or that. And, and the fact is, it's just not a true statement. We're not, we're never always the same anything. When we're in a really difficult time, it will, it can very easily feel like this is always going to suck. This is always going to be my situation. You know, kids in friend groups, especially in the teenage years, becomes a really interesting thing. And and you'll have like a kid in a friend group and then have some dynamic change in that friend group. And it affects the mental health of your your child because maybe they're being left out or maybe somebody is spreading rumors about them or, or whatever. And, and pretty soon this really short period of time could be a month that they're being left out or things aren't great with a friend group. And it literally feels like their whole entire life forever and ever condemned to this friend group hell. And it's never going to change. You can get a zit right in the middle of your forehead and feel like it's always going to exist and you're never going to be pretty again. And nobody's ever going to ask you out on a date and you know, whatever. It's really helpful to, to talk about time perspective in, in acknowledging, you know what, right now this really sucks and this isn't going to last forever. This will heal you will grow, you will learn, you will understand. You will not have the same chemistry teacher forever. You will not have the same boss forever. And so even circumstances that won't change, like this is going to be my mom forever, or, you know, this is, I'm, this is going to be my mother-in-law for my whole entire marriage, whatever. Circumstances within those circumstances will change. And it's, just a good perspective, coping mechanism, recognition, way to look at difficult situations. For sure. Well, and I think especially within a gospel context, if we look at things with an eternal perspective, we recognize that everything will change um, because we believe in the resurrection. So I love that. When we have somebody that we love who we know is struggling, talk to me about why, or even I guess when we don't know they're struggling, but talk to me about why connection is more important than concern. You know, this is just a really great concept. And most of the time, and, and now let's just talk as a parent. When, when, You've got a kid comes home crying, runs to their room, slams the door. You, you know, you know something's wrong or whatever. Our immediate response is to be like, what's wrong? What's happening? What's going on? To want to fix you, it. You, yeah, we're going in with all this concern. Like what, what's happened? And, and we have no idea, you know, what that is. And, and even if you have somebody that maybe they're that, negativity or depression that's happening over a long amount of time. Maybe it's been going on for a little while and you just can't get that information. You don't know what's wrong. Going about creating a connection first is going to open any type of communication with this person. And it, and it looks something like this, it, you know, rather than just only focusing on what's wrong, you focus on that person, you know, you know that they really love this type of a Slurpee or a drink and, and you show up with it and you, and you bring the drink or, um, you know, when you're driving in the car, you turn on their favorite song and, and you have a little dance party. And then after you've had the little dance party and after you've brought in some of your favorite treats or after you've sent a, sometimes I like to text a photo, a funny photo of a, a shared experience or even a meme or a funny TikTok, they work really well too. And when you get that 
little connection, like, okay, we're right here on the same page. Then you can say something like, I can tell things are a little off right now. And I just want you to know that when you're ready to talk, I'm here to listen, period. So what you've done is you've established a connection and you've opened the opportunity for communication. And it might not come in the next five minutes. It might take an hour. It might take till the next day. But if you just keep on reopening that door of communication without like, what's going on? What's wrong? Tell me everything. You know, you're going to establish that level of trust and they're going to be able to come to you on their terms. And then when they do listen and just let them share. And that is the most beautiful way to establish and use connection in a positive way. So well said. I think that what you just said reminds me of the Taylor Swift song, The Best Day, which I think um, shows like what a child remembers about their parents. And um, so I love that principle. Heidi, we've talked a little bit about how you feel like you've evolved as a person over the last seven years. But another thing that you talk a lot about is active evolution and making deliberate efforts to evolve as people. What does that look like? Well, the definition of evolution is really just to get better over time. And a lot of us, okay, I'm, I'm 50 years old. And as I think back to like how I was raised, I know that my mom and dad did the absolute best that they could. And I know that they were actually taking cues from their parents that they didn't like and tried to be better, you know? And, and even though there's a lot of things as I think back to the way that I was treated, I didn't like, and I was already trying to incorporate them. I, and I feel like I, I did, I feel like I am better in a lot of ways, but I think that it's really important as a parent right now, wherever you are or in any relationship that you are to acknowledge the fact that evolution is required of you and of me and of all of this evolution is required. And so not just to sit in the situation where you think, you know what, I am a pretty good mom or I am a pretty good wife or I'm a pretty good friend. I'm a pretty good sister. And so I'm, I'm okay here. I think it's important to ask yourself, what can I do better? And maybe there's topics and, and, you know, maybe they're gospel topics, maybe they're world topics, maybe there's issues that you and your kid or you and your spouse don't see eye to eye on. And that is a notification that you need to do some work. Like let's, you know, let's take a difficult topic like LGBTQ, um, in, in our world right now. And those of us who are 50 years old have a lot to learn about supporting the LGBTQ community where maybe our teenager, so it's coming a little more natural for them. And it, it doesn't seem as, as difficult to make those changes. Well, we have to look at this, these difficult situations and, and ways that we don't see eye to eye with people in our lives and recognize that evolution is needed. And that means that we need to go and listen to podcasts and read articles and educate ourselves on maybe even on both sides of those issues. And we need to say to our kids, how do you, how would you teach me? How would you help me understand so that I can improve and let yourself be influenced by your kids and influenced by your partner, influenced by the world around you in ways that you can be better and allow for those differences to exist, allow for yourself to be more loving and tolerant and patient and recognize that that's not just going to happen by doing nothing. It requires freaking hard work. Most, uh, most things that matter do seem to require really, really hard work. Okay. The last principle, I have no idea what this one means. So tell me what yet means. Yet is a wonderful way to end a sentence for a kid who is struggling or for yourself. If if you, if you can do it for yourself, but a lot of times you'll have a kid come home 
angry and upset and say, you know, no one is ever going to like me. You know, I, I didn't get invited to the dance. I didn't, I didn't get my round off back handspring. I can't understand my math. I don't have any friends. I, you know, I, I can't this, that, and the other. And these things like to us as a mom, you think to yourself, okay, it doesn't really, in the grand scheme of things, if you have your round up by handspring, it is not the end of the world. Or we know for ourselves, like if they got broken up with by their boyfriend, that likely there's going to be another boy that comes along at some time and catches your eye, right? We know this as a parent, but to that child or that person that's going through something that's really awful, it doesn't help to say, oh, don't worry, there's going to be somebody else or, oh, that handspring doesn't matter because it does. It does matter. And so what we can say is, you know, you just don't have it yet. You got to keep trying. You know, you don't understand that math yet. And you haven't found the right guy yet, or you haven't taken the time to work through this yet, but there is time. And I know it's important to you and I know you can do it. And I want to help you yet is this allotment of possibility that every one of us possess possesses in every circumstance to be and do and emerge into whatever we want to become. And there is time and there is opportunity. I think for somebody who's struggling with suicidal thoughts, it's never just one thing that is weighing on them. It's a million things that is hurting, that is scary, that is overwhelming, that isn't working. It's all of these things on top of each other. All of these things that kind of have gotten tied into a really big knot that feels impossible to fix. And I think that one of the most encouraging and supportive things that you can say to somebody is, you just don't know the answer yet. Answers can be found. Solutions are out there. Possibilities exist. And it might not be right now. It might not be tomorrow. But the possibilities, the answers, the solution, overcoming these struggles can happen if you get people on board to help you, if you're willing to talk about it, if you're willing to step back off the edge and let other people help you. It's often that we just, we don't know the, pro- the solutions to our own problems. But when we share our concerns, when we talk about them, there are, there are solutions that can, that can be found. I love that. And I will never think of the word yet the same. So thank you so much for sharing that. My last question for you, Heidi, and this is the question we ask at the end of every episode of the show is what does it mean to you to be all in the gospel of Jesus Christ? You know, I've thought a lot about this, this question. And I, I did know that this was the question that you were going to that you're going to end on and that I wouldn't that by saying yes to coming on this podcast, that, that, I would be required to, to answer this question. And, you know, I, I could probably go on and on for a really long time about what I think, but you know what? I, I recognize that there are a lot of, I mean, the reality is all the things that we've talked about, the, and the yet now is not forever, not freaking out, the forgiving yourself, like all of the things I've talked about, are also essential, helpful ways to approach being in the gospel. And, and I think negotiating our relationship with our Heavenly Father and with our Savior. 
I think that being all in in the gospel is being willing to let the the gospel allow you to grow and to learn and that you just don't have to know everything right now. Everything doesn't have to make sense. Everything doesn't have to be all checkboxed. Everything doesn't have to be just right. Being all in is allowing yourself to figure it out as you go and to, and to learn and to evolve and to allow yourself to have a question, to allow yourself to have a surety and to allow yourself to be loved by a perfect heavenly father and to be saved by Jesus, recognizing that you just don't have to have it all figured out. And, and maybe that's even a little bit contradictory to being all in is giving the gospel a chance to just work in your life. And I think that that's how I approach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love that. I, I, what you just said reminded me, and I don't usually say anything after people say their answer to what it means to be all in. But just last week I was teaching my, I teach a seminary class. And just last week, one of the boys in the class said, is, is Heavenly Father's plan supposed to be perfect? And I was sitting there and, and my husband actually was like listening And he texted me, it's like, yes, the savior is what makes it perfect. And I think that like life and mortality, like you mentioned several times, like things are not black and white. It's not this perfectly packaged thing that we're experiencing here, but God's plan for us is perfect. And that's why we have a savior. And so being all in means accepting, I think the messiness of life and embracing the fact that we have a savior. And so Heidi, thank you so much. I honestly cannot thank you enough. I'm so (laughs) glad that we had a chance to reconnect. And I just, I am so impressed and and really, really appreciative. Oh, thank you. It's, it's, it's fun for me to remember back those seven years and kind of, it's been good for me to just uh, evaluate my own growth in that, in that time, it's helpful sometimes to, to look back and give yourself a little, a little round of applause, maybe for (laughs) making progress, making progress. There you go. We are so grateful to Heidi Swap for joining us on today's episode. In honor of Suicide Prevention Month, we hope you'll join us in looking for ways to apply these suggestions in your life. I know I learned so much and I hope you did too. Big thanks to Derek Campbell of Mix It Six Studios for his help with this and every episode of this podcast. And thank you so much for spending time with us. We'll be with you again next week.